welcome to Communion and Shalom. In this podcast, we are exploring how the biblical and historic Christian faith can engage sexuality, ethnicity, culture, and our local communities as we pursue the flourishing of God's kingdom. Our goal is to engage these topics charitably and with nuance. Hello and welcome to another episode of Communion and Shalom. EJ and I are both here with our very special guest, Misty Irons. Thank you so much, Misty, for joining us today. It's good to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. Misty, you've been an ally of the Side B community for longer than I think I've known that it's existed. Uh, maybe even before <laughs> it knew itself was said, I can't remember. <laughs> but could you just introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, where are you from? Where are your people from? I am a native of Southern California. Um, I currently live in the San Fernando Valley, which is the northern part of L.A. County. I'm also a fourth generation Japanese American. And the way we count it is the, the first generation was the one who immigrated. So some people might think I'm third generation. On my uh, father's side mm. and my mother's side both lived through World War II. And um, so my father's side experienced the internment uh, during World War II mm. in the Manzanar camp. Um, I became a Christian when I was 17 years old in high school, my senior year. And I have been a member of the PCA denomination, the Presbyterian Church in America, since around 2004. And as for being a straight ally, let's just say that um, I've been a straight ally since before that term was kind of in use. And I didn't know I was mm. this thing called the straight ally. Someone mm -hmm. had to tell me that I was one. So, you know, back uh, in the year of 2000, I guess. And then there was a period of time when I referred to myself as straight ally because it was super uncool to do so. No straight person wanted anything to do with it. Mm. And then now we're at a place where you're not supposed to call yourself a straight ally because too many people <laughs> are self-reporting as straight allies and it's not your call to make. So now I don't call myself that, but I had to explain all that to you just now. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, well, regardless of terminology, you are a dear friend to the community and a, uh, and a true blessing. So I'm Thank excited you. for folks to get to know you a little bit more who maybe haven't, uh, yeah, just read from you or heard from you before. On a quick, the you mentioned the fourth generation Japanese American. It, I, I've wondered that before of like, oh, when, when do I start counting? Because my Mennonite great grandparents, they came here in the early 1900s. And so I have like, do you know, is there much, are, do different people count that differently of whether it's the ones who arrive versus the ones who were first born here? I think the most people counted with the first generation that was born here. And if you do so, uh -huh. then I'm third generation. As far as I know, the Japanese Americans are the only ones who count it from um, the immigrant generation. And, but the reason why we kind of stick to it is because there are Japanese names for it. Like, you know, the first generation immigrants mm -hmm. are Issei. And then people like my grandparents are Nisei who are born here. And then my parents are Sansei and I'm Yonsei. And so once you start naming it and referring to it and becomes part of your culture, it's kind of hard to change it just because that's not how yeah. the Chinese Americans do it or the Korean Americans do mm -hmm. it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, interesting. Thanks so much for sharing it. Just the, uh, with some of my immigrant neighbors and uh, always just learning of like, oh, your surname is actually something that you had to create when you were <laughs> coming into the U.S. system. And so it's just always a different thing when different cultures are bringing their different naming traditions and different language traditions and always a little bit of barriers we have to hop over to learn the different histories behind those. So, Absolutely. Thanks for sharing. Absolutely. So you mentioned uh, it's been a little over two decades now. Could you tell us a little bit about your story. How did you first enter into uh, this Christian conversation on faith and sexuality? It happened because um, in the year 2000, I was a very young pastor's wife. I was married at the time to a pastor, and we were part of a very conservative reform denomination called the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. And at that time, we were church planting in Los Angeles. And so uh, it was the time of, you know, the moral majority uh, Pat Robertson, and the culture was very conservative. Uh, even in secular culture, people were not at all favorable towards uh, gay people. 
And at the time I was just thinking about reaching out to people evangelistically and I had neighbors who were gay. So I started to try to befriend them because I just thought, well, this is LA, this is an unreached people group. You know, you have to be a missionary. And at the time there were really no books to read about how to, to do this in sort of a friendship evangelism way. All the books out there, they were from Christian public publishing companies were more about very condemning and very argumentative and talking about disease and talking about lifestyle. So my neighbor, he died of AIDS after I had known him for a couple of years and he never told me he had AIDS. I was not just really shocked and taken aback and saddened, but it haunted me, I think, because he never disclosed that to me. Not that we were close friends, but we were neighbors. And I felt that when you're so sick and you're you're dying of a disease, it's always nice to have a neighbor who can kind of like help you with that. And just the fact that he kept that from me told me everything I needed to know about how he and probably the whole gay community felt about Christians. So mm -hmm. I started to look at homosexuality, as we thought of it at the time, you know, like homosexuals and homosexuality, those are the terms we used. I started to look at that question more from a missionary perspective, not from a theological perspective, more from a, how do I reach people in this culture, in this subculture in my country, in America, here in Los Angeles? What what bars mm -hmm. do they hang out at? What, what do they read? What, where, where do they, you know, socialize? I, I wanted to know all these things so that I could do a better job of being a friend. And in that process of researching, I discovered that I didn't think that these people chose to be homosexual. Everything about mm. church culture and everything about society back then was like, this is a lifestyle choice and God has handed them over. And that's why they are you know, homosexual. And I realized when I first read testimonies that no, 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 no. This is this is not chosen. It was just so obvious to me that I couldn't believe it. I, I, I couldn't believe that. Where did this idea come from that people choose this? I, I was so flabbergasted. And also it really hit me that we're lying about people from the pulpit and we're using the Bible in such a way to sort of confirm there's enough truth in the Bible to, that sort of confirms our, our twisted idea of who gay people were that made it sound credible, but I started to realize that this can't be the truth. So I just, I think in my, in my being appalled at myself and being appalled at the church and, and seeing what a vast problem this was, especially from a missionary perspective, I realized that I need to make a decision about whether I want to do something about this. So what I did was I started a website where I, I posted some writings and the po point of the writings was just to say, Hey, if you're gay, I'm here. You know, I'm a conservative Christian. I believe you, I believe your story. And how can I, how can I show you that, that I love you, you know? And I knew at the time that the way to show somebody who is gay was not to say, oh, I love you, you know, I just hate the sin, but I love the sinner. I realized that there's, there are so many empty words that people were saying that was, that were just not hitting home with people. And the only way to really communicate love is to stick yourself out there. So at the time, there was no gay marriage, um, except there was like maybe civil unions in Vermont, you know, for same-sex couples. And I, I was reading about same-sex marriage and the possibility of a civil same-sex marriage in society, not the church, but uh, just a civil union. And I came to the conclusion that we can legalize this and there would be a lot of benefit to society if we did. So I wrote an article called A Conservative Christian Case for Civil Same-Sex Marriage. And I posted it on that website that I started where I make a case for why it's constitutional why it's uh, generally moral, because it would be a way to curb promiscuity, which was a problem because of AIDS and disease. And also that you didn't have to be, uh, you didn't have to believe in the morality of as a Christian because you can separate church and state. So I wrote this big article, I posted on there, and my whole purpose was just to be evangelistic. Just like, I want somebody gay to read this and go, hey, this Christian is like, you know, actually like took some time to to really understand me and, and everything. And maybe they'll feel loved, you know? 
And I got great feedback because when you post something on the web, even back in 2000, I kind of realized that it's kind of like posting a want ad. It's open, Mm -hmm. but it's anonymous, you know, and you can have conversations with people that they feel safe. So I enjoyed that reaching out to people, got to know people who are gay and lesbian for about a year and a half. And then remember my church denomination? (laughs) They found out. I was pastor's wife, church planting missionary. Um, People knew who we were and it was, it was rough. That's all I could say. Uh, My life was pretty much over, you know, I, I retained very few friends. It was, it was, it was pretty bad. It was, um, hate mail, uh, phone calls, things sent to me in the mail, like papers, like read my paper on like the 15 different ways that gay men are perverts and stuff like that. Um, charges against me, an effort to excommunicate me, um, an effort to, you know, uh, bring charges against my husband at that time. Uh, there was a heresy trial, um, lasted for almost two years. So mm-hmm. I felt at the time that while the easiest thing to do would be to leave, the faithful thing to do would be to stay and have this conversation with people because the denomination I was a part of at the time was probably one of the most conservative ones in the country. Um, there was a faction of people there who believed that Old Testament law should be legislated um, with capital crimes, with adultery and practicing homosexuality as capital crimes. So they believed that if you were caught, you know, in gay sex, that you should be executed because of Leviticus and, and that sort of thing. So those were the sort of people I was dealing with. And, you know, there's always the worry that of death threats and stuff. It never really kind of got to that place, but I had to monitor the hate mail to make sure that it didn't escalate to that place. I thought about mm-hmm. dying. I thought about how much risk I'm willing to take, you know. It, it got scary sometimes. There was a group of people who wanted to put porn on my website to discredit me. There were efforts to start a smear campaign against, you know, me, like saying that I, I didn't actually believe the Bible. I was actually, you know, what we now call side A and that sort of thing. So, yeah, would, and a lot of things happen. After, you know, we eventually were forced to leave And I could say now that because of that experience, I know what a lot of people go through with their churches when Mm -hmm. they are outed or pushed out or that sort of thing. So I can, I consider that experience to be sort of like, almost like a a, um, hazing or (laughs) maybe God was Mm -hmm. giving me a a testing period so that I could, I could know what it was like to, to be in the gay community. And so ever since then, I've just been, you know, after that, after I left that, I continued to write on the website, to blog. Um, I started a new blog. And after that, it was just a matter of, you know, I just understood people. I understood how to def- to befriend people. Most of the work that I do is just being friends with people, just mm-hmm. just being a good friend to people who are gay. I've, for, there was a period of time where I was the church. <laughs> I was people's church, a one, one person church, because churches were not interested. They weren't open at all to having these discussions. I was really glad when Wes Hill wrote his book. Mm -hmm. Um, And I had the privilege Mm -hmm. of of, uh, being able to edit one of the manuscript, help to help to edit some Mm -hmm. of the manuscript for that book. So Wes and I go way back. Gosh, it was around, I want to say 2010. But I don't, I don't know the Mm -hmm. exact, it was around that time, plus or minus. So I just mm. kind of hung around and just got to know people, just get to know people one one person at a time. Could you talk more about when you started connecting with, I think, QCF, or what is it called then? GCN? Um, GCN. GCN, yeah, when you started connecting with GCN, and then Side B as it emerged in the present times? Right, before uh, QCF, um, under Justin Lee's leadership, it was called GCN Gay Christian Network. And mm-hmm. actually, I used to read Justin's um old website called Bridges Across the Divide. Um, Mm -hmm. It was around 2006-ish, I want to say, where he and Ron Belgau and someone else named Sonia Balser would have these side A, side B friendly discussions. And I thought that was really fascinating because I was, you know, being sort of early on in the conversation, I was aware that there were two sides, you know, there were two different Mm -hmm. kinds of views for gay Christians. So I knew about Justin for a long time and, and he knew about me because of my blog. And so he had me on his uh, radio 
program, I think. He he did like mm-hmm. a equivalent of a podcast interview back in the day. And then he invited me to speak at GCN in 2012 and 2016. Uh, in 2012, I, I gave the full story of what I just kind of told you briefly about my time in the mm-hmm. Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Uh, it was it had been nine years, nine years. Yeah, nine years since we had left. And it was the first time I told the story. It's not a story I, I tell too often because I still like to kind of give people in that denomination a little bit of room to maybe change their mind about some of the things that they said or thought back then. I'm still kind of hoping that people will change. I don't want to sort of freeze them into, you know, a story that puts them back in 2002. So, but I told that story to GCN and in 2016, I also gave another presentation about just, you know, talking about, talking about side A and side B. Um, Mm -hmm. It was it was actually well received, and it's one of the presentations I'm I'm most proud of. I would say. Mm-hmm. Wow. Was 2016 when Side B started forming more collectively as like a a distinct community from GCN? Or was that later? In my understanding, when um, Justin was forced to leave GCN and the mm-hmm. organization translate transitioned into QCF, then there was the sort of the question of where side B fit in because Justin as a side A person was such a great advocate for side B. And Mm -hmm. so I think there was sort of a little bit of a period of uncertainty uh, is my understanding of it. And so Revoice formed in 2018 uh, during that time of, you know, GCN's transition to QCF. And so uh, my understanding and, or my impression I should say is that it was sort of related that okay, Revoice sure. forming into sort of a, a side B conference was sort of a place where side B would find their support. And not mm-hmm. that they couldn't find it at QCF, but certainly when Justin moved on, it was, it would uh, raise those questions and Revoice formed shortly afterwards. So in my mind, they're a little bit mm-hmm. connected. I'm not sure. Yeah. Don't uh, say that's gospel truth, but in my mind, they're sure. a little connected. Mm-hmm. No problem. Could you tell us more about how how you have related with side A theology over your history of engaging this conversation? Yeah, I realized that, you know, my theology is is lean side B. Mm-hmm. I take a sort of an accommodationist view approach, I should say, towards side A. And I, I'm a little mm-hmm. bit regretful that so much of the conversation is about strictly theology sometimes, because mm-hmm. once you start taking mm-hmm. Or, you know, I, give, I agree with this point and not that point, then it sort of creates the impression of more of a divide that maybe it should be. And to me, with, when somebody is a, a gay Christian, the thing that sort of creates a bond between me and that person is quite often over the scriptures and over our faith in Christ and over the gospel. And I mm-hmm. find that there are some side B Christians and some side A Christians who I connect with more over those things. And there are some side B Christians and some side A gay Christians who I connect with less. And a lot Mm -hmm. of that has to do with why people take the views that they do. Um, Mm -hmm. Is there a high commitment to the scripture? Is there a deep understanding of, of the gospel and your sinfulness and your need for Jesus Christ? And I find that those people who are side A or side B who share those those deep values and those deep commitments are the ones that I tend to connect with more. And, um, but a lot has to do with why, uh, for instance, maybe your side B, uh, because, because you're just afraid not to be, you know, mm-hmm. um, maybe it's an expectation from your family or maybe your side A because there were some circumstances that pushed you that way. And not so much mm-hmm. that, you know, you, you studied the Bible and you had this, this time of like, no, I think this is what the Bible says. So um, people have different reasons for for coming to these different views. So I I guess my first comment would be, I don't necessarily look at it as strictly about, you know, why take this side and that side theologically. Mm -hmm. But since you do ask about theology, I would say that I find side B compelling largely because of creation. Whereas I find side A is something that I could accommodate largely because of redemption. 
Okay. So when mm. when side A approaches the scriptures, there are a lot of really compelling side A arguments about uh, the so-called clobber passages. So maybe there's mm -hmm. like six or seven main passages in the Bible to say, hey, this is talking about the, you know, same sex, you know, sexual relationships. And, you know, this mm -hmm. is the one to interpret. And so side B and side A both, you know, look at these passages and, you know, side B has their traditionalist view and side A will have an answer or a rebuttal or an alternative view or something. Um, to me, that's, those are very compelling arguments. And so, you know, good Christian people can fall on either side. For me, side B is most compelling because of the creation story. Mm -hmm. When um, when we talk about, you know, Adam and Eve and the first marriage, a lot of times people will say, well, that's that's not prototypical. That's an example. That's just one marriage. Uh, we certainly don't all get married in a garden. You know, we certainly mm -hmm. all you know, now we get married before a priest or a pastor in a church, but, you know, we don't get married like Adam and Eve, just like, hey, you know, you are born of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Let's get, you know, <laughs> that's true. Uh, but at the same time, I can't get away from the fact that why is it actually so prototypical that when you read the very end of chapter two in Genesis, the author of Genesis makes this little editorial note where... He says, after Adam said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then, you know, they become one. He says, for this cause, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So he's like saying, because Adam became one flesh with his wife, that means that when all of us get married, we need to leave our fathers and mothers and cleave to our wives and become one, one flesh. If you're talking from a man's perspective, right? But Adam didn't mm -hmm. have parents. He is so prototypical that even though he didn't have parents, the positive aspect of him cleaving to his wife implies the negative of leaving your parents. And that's, he's so prototypical that that negative leaving your parents applies to us. Mm -hmm. And I can't get away from the fact that that the author of Genesis views Adam and Eve as prototypical, views them as being, no, this is how it's done. Mm -hmm. And another thing that, that kind of makes me think also is the origin of the female. The origin of the female is not out of the dust of the earth. She came when Adam was put to sleep and the Lord God formed her out of his rib. So he forms her out of his body and then the very next thing is that he then brings her to him and then they become married and they're called what? They're called one flesh. I just think, how do you explain the female unless there's something about her origin that has a lot to do with that marriage union afterwards? And I think mm -hmm. it's kind of a conversation that we avoid because we're trying not to be sexist. We're trying not to say that, oh, you know, if you want to say that a woman is truly I guess the same as the man, then she should be formed out of the earth as well. But she wasn't. She was formed out of his rib. And mm -hmm. if I know that people, I know the reason why people might be reluctant to point that out, but I'll point it out that there has to be a question like, why, why the female? You know, why is her origin that way? It does seem like it's connected to marriage. She comes from Adam's flesh and then she's made one flesh with him. And so it's hard for me to get away from the idea that that marriage is male and between a male and a female because of this origin story with the woman. Mm. And I think lastly, also, when you look at, you know, things like Leviticus 18 and 20, you know, some of those really uncomfortable passages, I, I don't think that we should be quoting Levit Leviticus 18 and 20, you know, to apply to gay issues today it, it just seems there's something there's so many like difficulties about the old covenant and is it moral ceremonial law and the word of abom the word abomination those sort of things but just generally speaking broadly speaking i do ask myself why are there no gay couples in the bible there's not even a, a one and the bible talks about a lot of things Le the bible talks about left-handed people the bible talks about eunuchs you know, the Bible mm -hmm. talks about these Nephilim. It talks about a lot of human phenomena, but doesn't talk about 
same sex couples. Mm -hmm. And, and I just think I go back to creation. I think that can't be an accident, you know? Now, having said all those things in favor of side B and the creation story at the same time, we are in a world that's fallen and redeemed in Christ. And I feel that when I learned about, you know, people who are gay didn't choose to be gay, that it became sort of like, you know, this is not a choice. This is not an act of rebellion. This is not, um, it's almost like I learned something about the nature of the fall that it can affect people in this way. It can affect people's sexualities. And why did Jesus come except to redeem the world, except to create, you know, sort of like a new creation, a promise, a resurrection where there would be hope for all of us who struggle with our fallenness. And so when I look at everything from the perspective of redemption, I feel that even though a lot of the arguments that side A gives to, you know, justify their viewpoints and stuff are, are things that I don't necessarily agree with. I feel that there's something bigger about the story of redemption, the promise of redemption and what people experience in Christ that really can enfold side A in many ways in a gracious way. And so mm. why else did Jesus come except for people who are in situations where, you know, I didn't choose this and this, this has caused me to be ostracized. This has caused me to be rejected. This has caused me to be, to be oppressed or judged. And, and didn't Jesus come to seek and save the lost? Didn't he come not for the righteous, but for sinners, you know? And so, I look at it that way as well. And I just think, yeah, you know, I have a lot of friends who are side A who I, I, you know, they're, they're genuine Christians. I ask them for prayer. I ask them for support. We keep in touch. You know, I, I fly out to see them. Sometimes I, I don't even think of people as being side A or side B anymore. They're just my, my Christian friends. Mm. So that's kind of, it's kind of where I'm at right now. And I've, been at that place for a while now. I was going to ask, have you also, have you engaged like what we call side X now, like X gay type teachings or people or organizations during your time engaging this conversation? I have made an effort to, I find that many, um, and this was kind of back in the day when side mm -hmm. X or X gay was, was sort of a big thing. I found it very difficult to connect with people, not because I was reluctant, but because I think a lot of side X people didn't really want to connect with me. I think that it's because I tend to, to probe deeply about mm -hmm. what people are going through and where people are at. And I, I, I very much appreciate, you know, like those honest conversations. Whereas I think with a lot of people who are going through X gay programs, there was a lot of, there's a lot of rules and boundaries. I feel that they were kind of straitjacketed by that didn't really mm -hmm. give them the freedom to have those kind of conversations with me is kind of how I interpreted it. I I'm supportive of anyone who, you know, wanted to give it a shot. I mean, you know, but the thing about Sidex that has always bothered me is more like the, the face of Sidex to the watching world. I've, I've never been supportive of that. I've never been supportive of the supportive of the equivocating about certain terms like change is possible freedom from homosexuality. You know, when you're a straight person, you hear and understand those terms very differently than if you're an insider to those ex gay ministries and, and they mean something different. And I have a problem with that. I have a problem with the fact that they allow there to be two different ways of interpreting it from the inside versus what they advertise. Can, can you elaborate more on the, the difference between inside and outside with like what change is possible, how that's coming across to different audiences. I mean, imagine that you are a father of a gay son, you know, and you're, you raise this family strongly Christian and you find out your son is gay and you find out there's this thing called, you know, I don't know, ex gay camp or something. And, you know, cure change is possible, you know, curing homosexuality and, and you just say, young man, you know, like you'd better, you better go to that camp and straighten yourself out, literally straighten yourself out and come back here, mm -hmm. you know, uh, cleaned up, like, like, you know, like sending someone to rehab or something. And, you know, you're not welcome in this house until you come back straight, 
you know, and, and what he means by that is I want you to come back and start dating girls and being interested in girls and, and, you know, the whole thing, you know, you become like me. Hmm. Um, and then, you know, kid goes out and finds out that, no, actually, that's not what they mean. We're just going to talk about, you know, diminishing desires and we're going to, you know, this is probably going to be a struggle. You'll be with, you know, you'll be struggling with your whole life, but we can sort of try to, you know, sanctify some of those, you know, bad habits and lust and, you know, this sort of thing. And, and it's just not what straight dad thought it was, you know, how, how could mm -hmm. that young man come back to his father and say, yes, you know, like I'm, I'm good now, dad, you know, according to what dad thought it was, it puts him in that situation of, you know, wow, this was false advertising. And what hope is there for me now? You know, even, even mm. at this X gay ministry, they're not, they're not, you know, they're not going to come through with what dad thinks it is. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's wrong. That I, as I've been trying to kind of see like what side X ministries still kind of exist. I've been trying to discern like all of our, you know, movements and thoughts that of course are developing over time, you know, so I expect that even, you know, Wesley Hill thought in 2010 that he has developed his thoughts, you know, a little bit, but of whether these ministries are like side X in the same way or whether there's like a neo side X, how different are they? And part of what I think I've run into is this kind of dual it's like differences in, in expectations being communicated through the same language and it makes it hard to discern like a, 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 a diminishment of desires. And we're saying that's changed. That's God working. And it's like, well, any of us desiring to diminish our, following into sinful temptations and pursuing obedience is what, you know, we'd say a work of God in our lives. But for that to be under this burden of like radical sexual orientation change, never coming back straight, never having to work with these things again, it's part of like not being ever exposed more directly to these ministries uh, when I was younger of like where... Was this an intent? Like, did they ha did their expectations change over time? Did they learn from their failures? Did they actually never have those expectations? Were they intentionally kind of were there these dual narratives happening that were inconsistent? Was this since I guess they weren't engaging with you? Was this mainly you hearing from friends who had gone through these ministries and had been experiencing this kind of dual? expectation or like mismatched expectations for what the ministries were trying to accomplish. Right. I mean, it's, I would say that, and, and this is something that was kind of like back in the day of about, about 2000 to 2000 and I don't know, 15 or something like that. Definitely the early 2000s. I went to um, an ex gay, an ex ex gay uh, conference where I heard a lot of stories. I've met a lot of gay Christians who have, been through um, ministries like Exodus or Desert Streams, met a lot of of the ex, ex gay leaders. Like, gosh, there's so many of them. Jeremy Marks, Alan Chambers. Gosh, the names are slipping my mind now. So I, I was, I can't say that I've ever been an insider, you know, into it, because obviously those are, you know, circles where I wouldn't be able to be a part of. So mm -hmm. I am kind of talking from more of the pers the perspective of getting sort of the blowback of it. Um, I mm -hmm. have noticed, though, that I've never met anybody who has ever actually changed their sexual orientation. And, um, you know, I've been doing this for a really long time. And I've talked to a lot of people say, have you met anybody? Have you met anybody who actually came from gay to straight? You know, not not like bi-curious or something like that, but went from gay to straight and no, never did. No, no, no one has. I said, if, if you meet anybody, give them my email address, give them my, my number. Mm -hmm. I, I want to talk to them. Search high and wide, never really found that. So, but I have read, you know, when you read a lot of like the testimonies, the testimonies are always really interesting back in the day. The testimonies often do talk about, you know, just diminished desires or else kind of like sort of skip over the struggle you know, the normal struggle that you, you would expect to hear about from someone who is, you know, dealing with sexual orientation issues. 
And sometimes they'll just kind of skip over that and say, well, and I'm married and I got three kids. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, I don't, I can't really answer those questions, but I do remember when Alan Chambers, the president of Exodus, the last president was going through um, his transition of, you know, like trying to grapple with some of these issues more honestly, kind of like you were saying, David. And I just kind of noticed that the more he grappled with these things head on, the more he was sort of losing sort of a grip on just like being the leader of Exodus, you know, and I don't want to speak for him or anything like that, but I just noticed how the more he tried to grapple with bringing, you know, together the experiences in within Exodus and with the public face of it, eventually what ended up happening was he ended up closing it down. Would you be willing to come, tell, tell us more about how you've seen the conversation on faith and sexuality develop in the Presbyterian and reform spaces that you've been in over the past several years? Maybe it might be after your OPC days, but maybe not. So. It's um, it's a little mysterious to me because after the, the whole trauma of the OPC, uh, I landed mm -hmm. in the PCA and was felt like I was pretty much left alone. And it could okay. be because of the kind of church that I was a part of. It was kind of an ethnic church and sometimes ethnic churches tend to be left alone um, yeah. to, to kind of do their own thing and give them space. And so I, I mm -hmm. felt like I had some space uh, in the PCA for the first, for that church where I was part of that for about 16 years. Um, I'm a part of a new PCA church where I feel very welcome and very, very much embraced. I think that as far as the denomination is concerned, it's a different experience being out on the West Coast than it is being, you know, sort of like closer to the Bible Belt and the PCA, where the PCA was, you know, had its origins. I think mm -hmm. that there there is a lot of controversy, obviously, um, as we know from the last couple of GAs. So mm -hmm. I know that those those views are out there, and but I do know that where I'm at, there tends to be a lot more latitude. So I've I've definitely um, reached out and befriended um, people who are gay in the PCA, and mm -hmm. I've definitely you know just just tried to be a friend uh, to people and and tried to be supportive. But it's it's an interesting place to be to be in a reformed church because I feel that uh, reformed theology, at least from my understanding, really does give us a lot of a lot of answers. You know, like. You know, questions about original sin are, are very well articulated. The grace of the gospel is very well articulated, it seems to me. There's really a lot of um, good categories to understand, you know, what it is that we we are seeing and, and what people are experiencing. And I, I feel that, you know, some of that is is a little bit wasted because, you know, when we get caught up in, in controversies over, you know, homosexuality, that's that's very, the lines are drawn very sharply and it becomes sort of culture war-ish, it doesn't really seem worthy of the the rich theology that we have as Reformed people because, you know, the depth of our understanding of the gospel and uh, certainly Pauline theology is very different from, like, a lot of what you see today in, you know, traditionalist churches that are engaged in culture war types of attitudes. Mm -hmm. Joel Carini is a PCA philosopher guy right now, and he recently wrote on the kind of sexual orientation as theologically a misery rather than a sinful reality. And I'm, I'm just wondering if, you, if you've read that at all and have reflected mm -hmm. on that since those are kind of like reformed uh, categories of like what are the effects of the, you know, what come after the fall, like the sin and misery of our conditions. Did I ever yeah, send that that's your way that's an no? interesting. I know he's referring to um, the catechism question. You know, that's talking about um, you know the outcome of the fall, the sins and miseries and stuff. So, I I I, I think it's interesting, and I think that you know those theological categories are certainly you know not just exclusive you know tightly you know bound categories. Certainly, when yeah. you experience sin, you do experience misery. Um, but, yeah. you know, I understand what he's talking about. He's talking about a fallen condition that is maybe not so much like morally categorized, but, you know, categorized as, as you know, as you would a lot of fallen conditions that would be, you know, misery. Um, mm -hmm. I tend to think of, I guess I'm not sure if I agree with that. I think it's kind of both, you know, I, but I, I do, I do 
I do think misery is is a huge part of what a lot of a lot of uh, sexual minority people experience. So I, I definitely do agree there. I, I guess I wouldn't say that it has nothing to do with sin at all. But at the same time, I don't really think that I've often wrestled with, you know, is is the condition of, of being of being gay, being same sex attracted. It's. Is it morally neutral or or do we call it sin? And I almost kind of feel like it's it's in between, you know, like it's there's there's definitely a, a neutrality about it where it's it's unchosen. But because it it touches on sexuality the Bible seems to view sexuality as being very much a moral category, but it seems like it's sometimes it's too strong to say that, oh, it's sin, because we often think of sin as being volitional. And so I, I kind of tend to think of it as being in between. So maybe my answer would be it's in between sin and misery. <laughs> is there any other sort of category in human life that you would also classify as between sin and misery? I think that homosexuality is unique. I think it's very unique. Yeah, I think Mm -hmm. it's unique. It's it's hard to find an analogy. Most analogies Mm -hmm. I'm very unhappy with. um, Mm -hmm. Because I think it's I think it's very unique. And I think that's why there's a lot of confusion. And that's why Mm -hmm. there's a lot of, you know, side A, side B, you know, side Y, side X and all this kind of stuff. Because, because it's, they're all sort of acknowledgments of the fact that we don't really have a proper category for this particular condition. Mm-hmm. It's like Andrew Sullivan wrote a book called Virtually Normal, and then he wrote an article called Virtually Abnormal. <laughs> and mm-hmm. as a gay author who's Catholic, he says that he feels that homosexuality is somewhere between the normal and the abnormal. Those are his words, not mine. Okay. But okay. I, I see what he's saying. He's He's trying to say something similar, which is that there's almost no category. You know, what do you do mm. with, with a situation where people are, this is like, this touches on your love. You know, this touches on your, the deepest part of your need for human companionship and relationship. And to just go and say, the Bible says it's not, you know, you can't have that. It just seems a little like, that's so harsh. Mm. It seems like it's, it lacks understanding of, of not just a gay person's sexuality, but of your own sexuality, you know, you, you're not even understanding if you're straight, you don't understand what this is that you have, you know, this, mm-hmm. this privilege that you have. And it's something that many people say they can't live without. Um, yeah, true. And I'm not, I'm not trying to say like something like the world is like, you know, all you need is love and what they mean to sex. You know, I'm not trying to say that, mm-hmm. but I'm, what I'm talking mm-hmm. about is something that's deeper, something that's a connectedness to another human being that culminates in maybe, you know, love, marriage, and sex, but whatever, whatever you want to call it, it's just a deep thing. I think that was always a, in early on and just trying as a young college guy trying to figure out what to do with like sexual desires and discerning that there's something deeper behind it and so like and if and if jesus like you know was single and but still like you know like engaging the fullness of what it means to be human that that whatever is behind the sexual desires uh there's something really real to be i don't know like in the right language right now, but to be, to be in a sense sought after and in that c- connection that we that we need as humans, yeah. So I, I get just the when the you that... see that Jesus calls the church his bride, and he lays down his life for her, and then he says that you know, now we are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. There's something very deep going on there. <laughs> You know, and there's something in God himself that he instills in us that's very deep, that originates from him. And when I first learned that there are some people who have this unchosen and sometimes unwanted same-sex attraction, I remember for about a whole month, I cried just thinking about Mm -hmm. it. It was just really Mm -hmm. 
it just saddened me so much and it was it was shocking to me i didn't i didn't know mm. that that could happen to somebody after we initially uh, connected at this past revoice it yeah just your your deep commitment in friendship to your gay brothers and sisters it just yeah left a a, a lasting impression that rung true with the type of kind of kinship that I am have been growing with my my neighborhood a neighborhood that is often forgotten and neglected and that people sometimes wish wasn't there and yeah and, and the way that you kind of stick stick with it and are hesitant or yeah I guess just acknowledging the the grief that uh, how quick other Christians would be, how quick they might join in that neglect and wanting, wishing that in this case, like it feels like my urban neighborhood or your gay friends weren't really there to have to deal with. And, and it was, it just, it hit me very deep in just your, your love and commitment and way that you've navigated that, those tensions don't have a question <laughs> just yeah thank you for your reflections that have stirred my own heart i also think when we met you at revoice i think your perspective or story was influential for our podcast manager elena who came with us who's a straight ally you might you could say and yeah so i think she appreciated hearing someone who's uh, been engaged in the conversation and maybe in the trenches as a straight person for a lot longer than she has been. And she mm -hmm. came to this conversation maybe in the last two years or three years. So yeah, I think that's worth appreciating. And I kind of wanted to then bring the question, what has it meant for you to be an ally to queer people, maybe specifically side B people, but yeah, what has it meant for you to be an ally to, side, to queer people and or side B people in your life? I think what it's meant is that it's really helped me to understand Jesus himself. Mm. And it's really, I don't think I really understood a lot of the, the things that I was reading in the gospels until I started to really seek after friendships and relationships with people who are in the queer community. Then mm. a lot of it just kind of like suddenly made sense. Like, Oh, this is, this is what it is. Like one thing that I really never understood was, I understood Christians as being, you have to be this really good moral person. And what I didn't understand was why is it the persecution and tribulation goes along with that? Like if you're mm -hmm. super nice to people and you're loving to people and you make it your aim to serve people, then why would anybody persecute you, you know? And then I realized that, well, you know, like to love somebody, is so much more than what we think it is because when when jesus says to love people or you know in the in the new testament like the new testament writers talk about love as being primary there is no conditions or there is no like hoops or you know you don't vet people <laughs> you know and when you really start to realize that you know jesus loves people unconditionally and then you know, like there's people who, you know, God calls, like, I felt really very much compelled and, and I was very, I felt very called to this. I felt mm -hmm. very connected to people who are gay, even though I am like, I'm not like anywhere near the bi sliding scale. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty straight, <laughs> you know, but I, I, there were so many other ways that I've, I've connected with people who are gay and it just felt like a calling. And then just engaging with people and, and loving people and, and hanging with people and, and having those conversations and just being kind of hated myself. It kind of mm -hmm. added this new dimension to why it is that when Jesus calls you to walk in his shoes, you, you will experience tribulation and persecution because the act of love is, is just a very radical thing. And there's something about it that, that, just really deeply brings you to the heart of God. And I know that God loves queer people because I felt it, you know, I feel it. 
I, I'm walking in it, you know, and he, and, and the, I think that what the thing that's so amazing about being friends with people who are, who are gay and believers is that God uses that trial and uses that sort of marginalization to, to so hone and sharpen and purify people. And there's such a, like a purity of faith in my gay friends. And there's such a, um, an honest struggle and such a, like, there's such a, such a precious kind of thing going on that I can't really put my finger on. It's so beautiful that I don't really understand how anybody could not love gay people. I don't really understand why the church you know, puts up such barriers because it's such a, it's such an adventure and it's so, it's such a wondrous thing to see people who are gay and Christian struggling and asking questions and doubting and, and recovering and, and moving forward and believing. And it's just like, I've just never seen anything like it. If it wasn't for mm. my gay Christian friends, my faith would not be as strong as it is now. I credit that to just being in in friendships with with my friends. And no there's no question whenever I have something that I need to talk about or I'm I'm going through something really troublesome to me, it's got to be my gay friends that I talk to. It can't be anybody else, you know. <laughs> Cuz they they get it, you know. And I mm -hmm. I really think that the church is missing out, just really missing out. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't understand how you can like have just like this treasure in your own house and just let it sit in dust, you know, or just want to shove it into, mm -hmm. you know, the closet, <laughs> you know, <Sure>. I don't, <laughs> I don't get that. I think it's a tragedy, but Hey, like I'm enjoying this part of the kingdom of God, you know, and I've, I've grown and benefited from this community. So I just think, okay, well, I mean, I've tried to like, you know, advocate or talk to people about it and all this kind of thing. But if, if people aren't interested, honestly, I'm, I'm just here to enjoy myself, like the, <laughs> sure. the growth and the community and the, the sharpening and the, the joy mm -hmm. and the sorrow of, of the whole thing. I just feel that mm -hmm. my life is so much richer, honestly. One thing we'll have to make sure to add to the show notes, I think the Theology in the Raw podcast reposted your Revoice speech from 2021, where you were making a comparison between Gentile identities and queer identities. And I felt like you at that conference I had, because I've been, you know, engaging these conversations around identity and labels. And, and I had, was reading the scriptures and, and seeing how Paul talked about the Cretans of like, <laughs> those Cretans are so terrible. And it's like, well, this is just like an ethnic, you know, geographic group of people, but he's associating them with like something wrong. And of course mm -hmm. there's probably going to be at least at some point, some Cretan Christians, even though they're... and then you like, I feel like beat me to the punch and then like one up it with the, the Gentile work like, Oh, it's even a bigger like scriptural paradigm. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was such a, yeah, it was so well done. Really. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Really Man, what's kind of feedback you got on that talk? Were people probably supportive? Do people want to like really critique what you were saying and saying it didn't apply? Were there nuanced accounts that you thought moved the moved the metaphor forward? Whatever. It was it was it was well received. I didn't mm -hmm. necessarily hear all the feedback. I think a lot of the feedback came to revoice you know the people who were running that conference, and mm -hmm. I just kind of went home and just went back to work and, mm -hmm. you know, made spaghetti and did dishes and stuff <laughs> like that, you know, while yeah. the world turned. And I'm sure there was a lot of feedback. The feedback I did get was, was positive. I, I guess I had to kind of wait till the very next conference the following year when, when people came up to me and started telling me that they brought the talk back to their churches and their pastors and their elders mm -hmm. um, who listened to it. And, and because I think the beauty of this message that God has really kind of put on my heart is that when I communicated it, there's really nothing new in it. It's all familiar stuff, but it's just sort of applying it in a way that maybe people hadn't seen before. And yeah. I think the beauty of that is that, you know, when a lot of people did bring it back to their churches and their pastors, um, it kind of connected right away. Like, oh, 
yeah, you know, that's that's true. You know, Gentile Christians. How can we have a problem with gay Christians? We don't have a problem with Gentile Christians. But that yeah. was a problem back then, you know, in the first century. It's this exact same problem. Mm -hmm. So mm. it was it was gratifying. It was gratifying to hear about like some little church in Nebraska or whatever that was where the pastor heard it and or or just, you know, little stories like that. But I, I trust that the word of God, you know, because it's God's word, it it just you know, the, God will do what he wants with it. I don't need to hear all the feedback to know that he's working and he's speaking. Mm -hmm. It's his word. So I did get some, some very negative blowback from a woman who wrote on the Christian Research Institute website. Her article came out, like Revoice was like, I guess in the fall and her article came out like maybe early spring or something. But it was a really odd article criticizing Revoice when she came to criticizing my talk, what she kind of did was she kind of went to my GCN talk, uh, the one we talked mm -hmm. about earlier in 2016, the one where I was addressing a society audience and presenting sort of my accommodationist view. And she quoted mm -hmm. from that talk and said, see, this is who Misty Irons is. And so the problem with that is that, you know, here she is criticizing my revoice talk by criticizing my GCN talk. One was done in, you know, 2000, what was it? 2021, the other to a side B audience. The other was given to 2016, a largely side A audience, you know, different audiences, mm -hmm. uh, different years, yeah. different conferences. So, and, and obviously, you know, when you hold to an accommodationist view, as I do towards side A, you know, the, the whole point of an accommodationist view is that you disagree with that view. You know, that's why you're accommodating mm -hmm. it. You know, like yeah. you don't have an accommodationist view towards side A unless you disagree with it. So mm -hmm. even the whole premise of, you know, um, her criticism of of me as a person, as I'm somehow like not actually side B was, you know, just not really not well thought through. So mm -hmm. I can't really say if there's anything substantial there about her criticism of my talk of my talk. But yeah, that's, you know, that's one of the blowbacks that happened. I think there's also a little bit of a misunderstanding that when I'm talking about the parallels between Gentile Christians and gay Christians today, a lot of people think of the Jewish Gentile divide in the first century as being kind of purely an ethnic divide. And while ethnicity was a big part of it, it wasn't really the heart of it. The heart of it was mm -hmm. the fact that there was a circumcision controversy that the Jews are people under the law and the Gentiles are people without the law and the Gentiles uh, needed to be circumcised to be under the law in order to become Jewish. And then Paul comes along and Jesus comes along and also there's a big paradigm shift. And it's like, no, whether, you know, like Paul says in Romans two, you know, those who are without the law, they will perish without the law. Those who live under the law will be judged by the law. So, it doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, whether you're Jew or Gentile, the law was crucified, you know, with Jesus. And so you are not, not under law, but under grace. It's this big paradigm shift. So when, when the first century Jewish Christians had to accept that there are Gentile Christians, it's because of the law. And it's because of this paradigm shift of being not under the law, but under grace anymore. Um, being under grace is, is like, you know, is being in Christ. And so this whole thing with Jews and Gentiles, it's not, it's not really proper to say that it was just about overcoming racial prejudice or human, you know, ethnic prejudice or something. It was so much bigger than that. It was actually a divide that God himself created when he gave his law through Moses and then called this people to be his people and to be circumcised and to become enter into this law covenant and that everyone else is an outsider and alienated from that. Then Jesus comes along and he like brings those people together. That's like radical. And so it's okay to be a Gentile Christian because even though at one time the word Gentile meant sin, the word Gentile meant unrepentant, it meant alien, it meant idolater. To be a Gentile Christian is like, yeah, so are the Jews. The Jews are also alienated from God and sinners and lawbreakers, you know, and idolaters and all those sort of things. And so Jew and Gentile are now both in need of Christ. And so, yeah, you're a Jewish a Christian, you're a Gentile Christian. And I would argue that it's the same with the gay straight divide today, you know, gays and straights, 
you know, okay, you're sexually broken. Well, like straights aren't, you know, and, and the whole point is, is not to have this righteous identity that you can boast in, but it's to boast in Christ. And I would argue that mm. you can't really have a, a, a true identity in Christ if you're going to like boast in your straight identity, you know, because now your, your straight identity is competing with Christ's identity, you know, but to say that you're a gay Christian and to mean that, you know, you are in need of Christ. That is very consistent with being in union with Christ, with having a Christian identity. Uh, Paul himself said, I am the chief of sinners. You know, Matthew, who wrote the Gospel of Matthew, writes himself into the story as Matthew the tax collector. <laughs> That's not a great label to have, but he's Matthew the tax collector. <laughs> 50 years later, after he's been following Christ for 50 years, it's just, uh, Simon the Zealot, you know? <laughs> it's, um, to identify with your your sinful past with with to call yourself a sinner you know by using these labels by identifying with your sin that is a very christian new testament thing because paul himself is like you know i could call myself the pharisee of pharisees the hebrew of hebrews circumcised the eighth day of the nation israel a hebrew of you know like i could call myself all those things but i have counted all those things as loss and i've thrown it in the trash heap so that i could gain christ and if that's how Paul's attitude is towards his very righteous, very law-abiding Jewish identity, if he's throwing that in the trash heap, why are we straights holding on to like, well, you know, you guys need to become straight. You need to go to ex-gay camp, become like me. No, Paul would never do that. He didn't send the Gentiles to ex-Gentile camp. To do that would have been mm -hmm. to circumcise them. And that heresy is called the Judaizing heresy because... Mm -hmm. There were Christians in the first century church who wanted to Judaize the Gentiles, just like we want to make gay people straight. Change of identity. Mm -hmm. And so that was a heresy, which we acknowledge existed back then. And I would suggest that we're kind of doing the same thing now. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. And yeah, for coming on this podcast as a whole. It's great to connect with you at Revoice. Great to connect with you here. And I look forward to the next time the Lord brings our paths together. Well, thank you. It's been an honor and a pleasure to be your guest here. Thank you. Thank you, listeners, for joining. And we hope wherever you are, the Lord continues to bless you and encourage you. And that we hope these thoughts were, yeah, provoking or encouraging as well. Bye. Hey listeners, I want to let you know about the Communion and Shalom Patreon. Joining the Patreon community not only supports this podcast, but gives you the opportunity to listen to bonus content, give input on future episodes, and submit questions for a patron-only Q&A. We're so thankful for the support and encouragement from so many listeners, and we hope that this podcast continues to be meaningful to you.